What the hell, Dallas? I don't even know where to begin on this one. Well, you know what? I do know where to begin because it's the same shit we've been saying for years now. The Dallas Cowboys, as has been the case all season long, got off to a slow start in this game. Dreadful offense through the first quarter. Fell behind 14-0 immediately right out of the gate to the Minnesota Vikings. Now, Dallas has been a pitiful team when it comes to scoring in the first quarter. In fact, in the first quarter this season, I believe they are a minus 19 overall in terms of points scored. However, if you look at between quarters two through four, Dallas has been incredible. Yeah, minus 18 through the first quarter. This is from Bobby Belt on Twitter. Minus 18 scoring in the first quarter for the Cowboys this season. Quarters two through four, plus 99. And New Orleans is the only time Dallas hasn't scored, uh, outscored the opponent between the second and fourth quarters this year. It's the slow start that has killed Dallas this entire season. And Dallas, we know, every time they run out there for the start of a game, they have these 10 to 15 plays pre-scripted. Stuff where they're like, all right, regardless of what we see, these are the plays, this is the progression. Because we know Dallas likes to dig in and to stick with the game plan regardless of what the evidence tells them otherwise. Oh, against the Jets, you lost Amari Cooper very quickly, surprisingly. Well, we can't adapt to help the other receivers in the offense. Oh, we're playing with two backup tackles? Well, pfft, I don't know what to tell you, bro. We can't make any adjustments. We don't chip. That's not what we do, so we're not going to do it. Dude, you have to adapt to the situation. You do. There is no other way to look at it. If you don't adapt, you get destroyed. And that has largely been the case this year. Once they get outside of that first quarter, those first 15 or so scripted plays, at least the offense generally can survive, right? At least it can move the ball. It can put points on the board. This is crucial, crucial stuff. But even then, and this is why I say it all goes back to what we've known for years, it always comes back to Jason Garrett because in big moments, as has been the case throughout his entire coaching career, he can't handle the pressure. Now, I don't mean like the pressure like, oh, if the Cowboys lose a couple games here, he's going to get fired midseason. He's actually good at that. I'm talking about the pressure in a game. When Dallas will have the ball and they'll be driving for a game-winning score or at least a game-tying field goal, something like that, they get momentum and they start moving. We saw it in the playoff game in 2016 against Green Bay. We saw it again in this last game. We get into position to do something, and it's like Garrett gets like stressed out. and He's like... Oh, I got to slow everything down. I got to slow everything down. You know what? Run the ball. We haven't run the ball for shit in this game. As you see on the stat board behind me, Zeke had 20 carries for 47 yards. That's 2.4 and average. He got nothing on the game. And yet Dallas kept running him, kept running him, kept running him on first down. As David Moore points out on Twitter, Sunday night's game was only the third time in franchise history the Cowboys failed to pick up a first down running the ball so they couldn't convert a new set of downs unless Dak threw the ball that's what it tells you and Dak was spectacular last night for what it's worth yeah you see that pick but it was on the Hail Mary at the end having to throw the ball 60 yards I'm not mad about that Hail Marys get picked off almost almost an automatic like unless you have like an Aaron Rodgers throwing it that's going to be picked off but this is just ridiculous the way that this all unfolds, because Dak on the game was fantastic, not just on third down, but in all downs. I mean, Dak, yeah, slow first quarter, everything there on, greatness. Those sideline grabs, yeah, those are fantastic grabs by Cooper, the Michael Jackson moonwalker type catch uh, on the sidelines where he's catching the ball, toes in bounds, but leaning four yards out of bounds. Those are incredible, but you have to give Dak credit for those too. And Dak had 397 passing yards on the game. Dak converted three different times on third and 12. Dallas continually ran the ball on first down and got stuffed at the line or suffered a loss. And Dak had to keep bailing their asses out with big throws, basically saying, okay, I got two, two downs now to get a first down. Oh, what's this, third and 12? Okay, here you go. Convert it, convert it, convert it, convert it. He got the ball at the end of the game at his own six-yard line. 
his own six yard line and he moved them all the way like effortless all the way to the Minnesota 11 yard line we had about what 47 seconds left in the game what happened Garrett freaked out Garrett goes okay uh run the ball it's third or it's uh yeah third and two excuse me it was second and two at the time from the Vikings 11 run the ball stuffed for nothing okay okay that's fine do it again that's pretty much what he did Garrett pretty much looked at it and said all right let's run it again let's run it again but you know what instead of going up the gut let's uh let's do an RPO and send Zeke out to the side let's send him out to the left flank oh look at that stuffed for a three yard loss now it's fourth and five okay um well Dak can you bail us out from this you know what let's target Zeke Hey, give Kendricks credit. He made a fantastic play for the Vikings to break it up. But that was the game. I know Dallas got the ball back, but then you had, of course, the the mind-bogglingly bad Tavon Austin play where if you ask Jason Garrett today, he's going to tell you, well, we didn't give him a firm answer on calling the fair catch, so he must have seen something in that moment. The guy has been returning kicks his whole life. It's basically the only time he's allowed to do anything. He's a veteran. I have a hard time believing that Tavon Austin in that moment just went like, I don't want anything to do with this. I don't care if I have 20 yards between me and the nearest defender. Now, to be fair, we don't know when he held up his hand for the fair catch. So that picture that's going around showing how much space he had, you know, the defense, the, the Vikings coming at him, probably slowed down to a trot when they see that, oh, he's already called fair catch. And they're not worried about the recovery because, well, I whatever Tavon the odds of him uh, muffing it in that point who knows but I have a hard time believing that that was all on uh, Tavon and that he wasn't given a pretty firm answer of hey maximize our time we're out of timeouts just fair catch it we'll see what we can do as Bobby Belt points out on Twitter this was the fifth time in Dak Prescott's last 13 regular season games he's thrown for at least 380 yards that sounds like an elite quarterback Dak's last 16 regular season games, 399 completions on 572 attempts. That's a 69.8% completion percentage. 4,732 yards. That's 8.3 yards an attempt. 29 pass touchdowns, 12 interceptions, 6 rushing touchdowns for a quarterback rating of 102.8. Stop trying to lay this at Dak's feet. You are beyond ridiculous if you lay this loss at Dak's feet. Dak on third and 12 this season is 11 for 17 for 220 yards, a touchdown, eight first downs, and a 127.7 passer rating. Dak bails Dallas out. The offense went as Dak went last night. Yeah, Zeke drew a lot of attention, but Zeke didn't do jack on the game. Nothing. He was thoroughly outplayed by Dalvin Cook, who had, what, 97 rushing yards and like 86 receiving yards? Dalvin Cook came in saying he believed he was the best back in football. You hear a lot of guys say that. But his main goal was to outplay Zeke. He did. Zeke did nothing. And the Vikings were without their main nose tackle. Now, I mentioned earlier on that three-yard loss on third and two from the Vikings at that point, 11. Uh, Something else that's damning, as I said, the Vikings without their nose tackle. It's a bad play call. But I'll say this, Travis Frederick and Connor Williams – you got to you gotta make that play. You cannot get blown by in that situation to let your back get killed three yards in the backfield. You just can't. So as much as I hate the decision, I will lay it somewhat at the player's feet for not executing. But you know what? I lay this predominantly at the coach's feet because it's their identity. The Cowboys do not adapt in game to what they're seeing. They never stray or anything from what the game plan was coming in. They never change up those first 15 scripted plays to start the game. And as a result of that, the offense gets off to a slow start every week, and they start in a hole, it seems like. Dallas Dallas should have won this game. They took the ball out of Dak's hands when it mattered. And I, and I wrote an article earlier this year talking about how when the game really mattered, when everything was on the line, they said, for whatever reason, we're going to be a running team. We're going to we're, screw everything. We're going to run the damn ball here. Are you kidding me? 
let me see here. I got some stats to give further context to this situation. I already said Zeke 2.4 yards a carry. Zeke running the ball on first down, not only was it pathetically predictable, but it got them nothing. No first down rushes. Zeke didn't have anything going for him on the day. It constantly put the offense in holes. And you can show Jason Garrett all those analytics you want. It's not going to matter. It's not going to sway his opinion, his assessment that I don't care what the analytics say because I don't believe that. He acknowledged we had not run the ball well all day. But in that moment, Dak and Garrett have said, the, uh, the logic was when we were down with 47 seconds left, down 28-24 at the Vikings' 11-yard line, we wanted to run the clock. Here's what that tells you. Here is what that tells you. Jason Garrett has zero faith in his defense. Why? You don't burn clock there. You go for their throat and you go for the win. You don't mess around and try and say, well, it's not a question of if we're going to score, it's when. No, dude, you get the points when you can get them. You don't mess around and leave it to chance. You don't go, we're going to run the ball a couple of times because we assume we're going to pick up at least two yards on two carries. Generally, you would think that, except if you looked at the actual evidence of what this game was telling you. If you actually looked beyond your your grand view of things and said, what's happening in this game? What's happening tonight? Maybe that's not the best thinking. You get the points. When you say, we want to run clock, you're basically saying, hey, I don't trust my defense to keep the Vikings out of the end zone. Not even talking about out of field goal range, because you would have gone up three points in that situation. You would have, if you got a touchdown, you go up three points and the worst the Vikings can do is force overtime. Were you the walking wounded? Were you hurt? Or was Dak carving them up? Was Dak getting rolling and making all kinds of ballsy throws and plays? Dak had a tremendous game. And if you set aside that first quarter where he was slow, like the rest of the offense and the rest of the team, frankly, Dak balled out one of the best games of his career and you wasted it. You wasted it because you didn't trust your defense. You said, if my offense gets me a touchdown here and we have, let's say, 42 seconds left, let's say the very next play, worst case scenario for Garrett's fearful thinking, worst case scenario, 42 seconds left, your offense is now up, your your team is now up three points. You're telling me in that situation with the Vikings having, I think, one timeout, feel free to correct me, fact check me on that, one time out, you're telling me you're afraid they're going to go all the way down the field and put it in the end zone. What's the worst thing that can happen if they get a field goal? Oh, no, it's overtime. You have zero faith in your defense? Oh, but what if the Vikings win? What if the Vikings win the coin toss and they just move down the field in overtime and score? You have to have some faith in your team. You can't, on one hand, tell us you think that you have a stacked defense. <laughs> you can't tell us you think you have a stacked defense and then turn around and basically be like, yeah, but I don't trust them. I don't, I don't want them out there. Dak was balling. If Dak touches the ball in overtime, the Cowboys go score again and close it out. Or if it doesn't even have to go to overtime, if your defense gets the stop that you expect that they should be able to get in that situation, it's over already. It's over. It's over. It's over. It's over. You had no faith in your defense. You had way too much faith in your running game because you wouldn't look at the damn evidence staring you in the face in that game that it wasn't working. You, you didn't just roll the dice once. You did it twice. You killed the drive. You completely killed the drive and asked Dak on fourth and five to bail you out. And if not for a Kendrick's diving fingertip breakup pass on a check down to Zeke in the flat, not in the flat, but at the five yards they needed, basically, you still would have gotten it. And some people want to lay that at Dak's feet. Miss me with that nonsense. That's all that is. That's nonsense. That's a non a non-starter of a debate because you have nothing to substantially back it up. Dak has the second highest QBR in the league this year. The Cowboys are the number one offense in terms of total yards and number one in the league on converting third downs. Your quarterback 
has a hell of a lot to do for that because Zeke has only had two great games this year. Say what you want, man. Dalvin Cook had himself a tough game too, but he also made the moves, made guys miss when he had to. Zeke hasn't done that consistently for us this year. In fact, Zeke hasn't done that consistently for us in over two years. I've contended from the start, Zeke is not the home run threat, the blow you away guy that he used to be as a rookie. He's still a good back, a really good, fierce back, but he's just steady. He's steady and calm, and that's something Jason Garrett loves. Now, off the field, he's not necessarily steady and calm, but you put him on the field, and you feel like, hey, he can churn up chunks of yardage once we get going. (sighs) The over-reliance on this offense and the belief that we are Zeke, that we are Zeke-centric and everything else just works around him, that belief and that stubbornness to that philosophy, that arrogance to that belief cost you this game because to you it was it was an automatic oh yeah Zeke they haven't run the ball up front well all game despite the fact that the Vikings were without their starting uh nose tackle doesn't matter uh Zeke yeah we'll get the we'll get these yards we'll burn some clock why Stop overthinking it. Just put the damn ball in the end zone. Your quarterback's carving him up. Keep it in his hands. Why do you think you got all the way down the field in that situation? Because of your quarterback. And as we want to have this conversation here, as we want to sit here and talk about, oh, well, you know, it's really hard to win when you're not healthy, right? When you have key injuries, whether it's your tackles, whether it's your starting wide receiver, your wide receiver number one, uh, you have injuries like that, it's hard to win in this league. Explain to me how the Saints beat you without Drew Brees. Explain to me how the Packers beat you without Devontae Adams. Explain to me how yesterday the Vikings beat you without Adam Thielen. Explain to me how the Eagles won a Super Bowl with Foles and without several other key players, including their left tackle including their best linebacker. Explain that to me. You coach, if you have a quality coach and depth, I'm not going to say it's just one or the other. If you have depth, which I believe the Cowboys have a very talented roster, and you actually have the coach who can work around it, who can adjust on the fly and protect the guys he has to protect and put the others in position to actually make something happen instead of saying, hey, you're going to have to keep running Keep running things just like the guy in front of you did. We're going to keep everything the same geared towards you that we had it geared towards him. If you can't make those adjustments, you're sending your guys out there to fail. That's what it is. Good coaches can, at least regularly, not always, but pretty consistently coach around a couple of significant injuries. Now, there are going to be ones you're dead in the water. If you lose Dak Prescott, you're dead in the water. Uh, I don't think if you lose Zeke for a game, you're dead in the water, but you're still at a disadvantage. Good coaches can coach around that. Jason Garrett has shown in 10 years as the head coach, he cannot coach around even the slightest, even the slightest disadvantage from a fully healthy roster. I mean, that, that's the truth of it. When he hasn't had Tony Romo or Dak Prescott as his quarterback, he's 1-13 as a head coach. At some point, man, at some point you have to acknowledge this mentality, this stubbornness and arrogance, whether it's in the play calling, whether it's in the game plan, it all it's the entire identity of this team. And it doesn't matter how damn talented your players are. Eventually, you can't just go out there and go, well, we're just going to impose our will and they're not going to be able to stop us. You know why you can't do that? Because every time you get in the playoffs, whether it's the wild card matchup, whether it's the divisional round, which you haven't gotten past since the freaking 90s, it's the same thing. Eventually, you're going to run into a team that is just as talented, if not more talented than you are. And you have to see what's working and you have to be willing to deviate from the initial game plan based on the new information of what's happening. Other teams do that to us. Mike Zimmer did that to us in this game. He saw what was working for them offensively for uh, the Vikings. He made adjustments. Defensively, they made some adjustments. Now, Dak was carving up the secondary, but the run game? No, he's basically like, I don't care. Dak's going to have to beat us. Well, guess what? Dak was beating his ass. 
And then what happened? You got stubborn. You got tunnel vision on what you believe. This is our identity. And this is how we're going to win the game. We're going to win the game on our terms, not your terms. Who freaking cares? You're winning the game. Mike Zimmer dared you to beat him with Dak. And even though you were doing it the entire time, even though you were doing exactly that, when the push came to the shove, you said... I don't care if he's playing to stop Zeke. If he's selling out to stop Zeke, I'm going to run the ball, damn it. That doesn't cut it. You saw what came of that. And if you could show the slightest, the slightest bit of awareness, of emotion, we could at least somewhat understand that you've learned from your mistake, but you won't even do that. You're going to go out there and you're going to say the same damn thing you say every time. You're going to go out there and say, well, you know, it's a hard it's hard to win football games in the NFL. Uh, we did a lot of things good, a lot of things we're going to have to look at uh, improving and cleaning up on. But uh, yeah, we're, we're not we're just going to focus on us and we're going to worry about that. Dude, show some awareness. I understand you have the side you show to the public and to the media and you have the side you show to your locker room. I get that. But holy crap, at some point, you have to acknowledge. You have to show some urgency to really rally the team. To tell people that you understand you messed up. And you acknowledged. I have your quote here. You acknowledged that you went against, that you have input in this. Here's, uh, here's a fun stat for you. I forgot to mention earlier, but I referenced it. On first down, the Cowboys passed 14 times for 108 yards, 8.3 yards an attempt. They ran it 16 times for 39 yards, 2.44 yards. Uh, here are just some of the examples. It's not all of them. Uh, this is from John Owning uh, on Twitter. Uh, Zeke, negative two yard run, six yards. Cobb, incomplete pass, zero yards, obviously. I mean, this is just him laying out a drive. And you see every time Zeke's name comes up, it's either negative yardage or it's uh, a loss, negative yardage or a zero, excuse me. Uh, Garrett's quote after the game, you want to attack in different ways. It's important for us to continue to run the ball. In normal circumstances, you'd think we'd give it to Zeke a couple times. Second inside two yards, second inside two yards, we're going to make that first down, which it didn't happen this game. He hasn't learned a damn thing. He just said, yeah, it's who we are. It's what we do. I don't care if uh, if it wasn't working this game at all. That's who we are, so that's what I went for. Dude, you are so, so blind. You don't have situational awareness here. Him talking about the Tavon Austin thing as well, the fair catch that killed us uh, at the end when we could have at least gotten into Viking territory and had a chance to at least work with shorter yardage with 17 seconds, I think it was at that point. Garrett says the way we the way he saw it, he went ahead and made a fair catch. Looking back at it, he might have had an opportunity to go. And that's basically Garrett saying, hey, he had the freedom. Not us. Not our fault. As for the offense and the play calling and Garrett's role within it, he says, we just try to communicate as an offensive staff. I certainly have input throughout the ball game. Situationally, I have input. That's how we've operated all year long, and that's how we operated tonight. What that tells me, Garrett's going to veto things. So those two runs there, I tend to think that's Garrett sticking his nose in there because there's a either Kellen Moore gets too locked up in his own head and messes himself up, or as we've seen throughout Garrett's coaching career, the Cowboys offense gets rolling, gets things going, and he's going to draw back. He's going to get risk averse, a risk aversion, and he's going to go, ooh, I don't know. We're moving quickly. We're moving the ball. Ooh, what if we score too early? Uh, ooh, okay. Uh, let's slow things down. Let's slow things down, minimize the chance for a mistake, and uh, at this point, we're going to go conservative. Yeah, 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 conservative. We're not going to worry about possibly throwing an interception or anything like that. We're going to give the ball to Zeke. We're going to try and run it up the gut. Oh, okay, that didn't work? Okay, um, 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 it's fine. We're going to we're gonna give it to Zeke again, and we're going to see if he can make something. Oh, shit. Okay, um, all right, fourth and five. Uh, Dak, Dak, can you do something here? We're going to have to throw it, obviously. We can't throw Are you kidding me? It, it's like he freaks out and he doesn't know how to act. I referenced earlier the 2016 Green Bay game. Dallas had rallied back from 28-3, to three, got all the way back, tied the game, 
and were driving, and they were moving the ball with a chance to win it, and Garrett calls a timeout because it got too real. It got too tense. They were moving. They had momentum. He stops the ball, gives Aaron Rodgers, leaves some extra time for him on the clock, and what ends up happening? The drive stalls after the timeout. You left that extra time for Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers goes out, does Aaron Rodgers things, and boom, you lose the game on a last-second field goal, a field goal attempt that wouldn't have even happened had Garrett not called a timeout. That's what I'm talking about. The moment gets too big, and when the moment gets big, he shrinks into himself, and he decides, we're going to remove all risk. We're not, we're not going to play to win. We're going to play to try and not lose. And because of that, you lose. You lose, and you lose, and you lose. And it's the head coach through and through. All throughout this team, top to bottom, it doesn't matter how talented you are. It doesn't matter your depth, how many pro bowlers you have. It doesn't even matter that you have Dak Prescott playing as one of probably the three or four best quarterbacks in the league this year. It doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, the coaching staff, i.e. Garrett, is still going to take the ball out of his hands and is still going to be stubborn in what they are and what they do. And they don't care that the other team, you played right into their hands. They don't care. They don't care that they're playing into the other team's hands because he still thinks this is the 90s and we can run over whoever we want because that's what we do. Dude, you're living in the past. We're a good running team, but we're not a dominant team dominant offensive line like we were in 2014 like we were in 2015 even without DeMarco Murray and without Tony Romo and Dez we're not that same team 2016 was the last year of great offensive line play 17 they were bad 18 they were good very good not great not as good as they had been previously obviously you didn't have Travis Frederick and this year they've been again on the higher end of good for the most part but they're not the dominant team they were you have to adapt. And if you don't, you're going to continue sinking this team. But hey, the only solace I have for many of this, we I mean, we've been saying this whole time. If the Cowboys can't make the NFC Championship game for the first time since 96, or is, yeah, if they can't do that, Garrett's probably gone. It's the last year of his deal. All they have to do is not re-sign him. That's what we've been saying this whole time. If they don't do that, Garrett's gone. If they don't make the playoffs, I'm 99% sure he's gone. But if he's not, if somehow, some stupid ass way, they keep Jason Garrett, then the cycle of mediocrity will continue because the Cowboys are a damn circus more than they are actually a contender. They are the perennial pretender. And the only times they even have good good teams and a chance to really contend, their damn coach gets in their own way. He's a disadvantage in every game he plays in because he can't make adjustments in real time. It's pitiful. It's pitiful. I don't even know what else to say. I know I've been ranting for a long time here. This is just the cycle that we have been trapped in for years. Jason Garrett wasted a Hall of Fame quarterback in Tony Romo's entire career, pretty much. Pretty much. Because he didn't take over. He came in in 07, which was Romo's first full year as a starter. He wasted Romo's entire career as a starter. And now he's already wasted four years of Dak. At some point, you have to realize, hey, maybe we shouldn't let him do this again. Maybe we should get an actual coach in here. Somebody with a little bit of adaptation. Uh, adaptability in these situations I'm not saying you have your coach necessarily on your coaching staff or whether your team Kellen Moore which I think is way too fast to elevate him to that level uh, team Chris Richard or whatever I'm not saying that's the answer but you have to do something because as long as you have Jason Garrett you will never reach the mountaintop there's nothing else for me to say I'm gonna cut it here because I don't want to get back on another cycle of ranting where I'm just repeating a lot of the same garbage I've already been saying. Uh, so until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Shit!